Marcus Olson and I had quite a conversation. He doesn't call himself an MSP. And our conversation actually went further. We talked about what keeps him up at night, what his take is on the future, and his take on the tools providers. This is part two of that interview in a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. So with the world sort of moving faster and faster with technology, getting more embedded into each of our, you know, and I'm going to use the traditional sort of customer, uh, you know, imb embeddedness, what keeps you up at night about where this is all going? I mean, it's kept me up at night for 15 years. The reality of it is, in my opinion, um, the industry is in serious trouble. And I think that the reason the industry is in serious trouble is that customers are wanting more and MSPs are, are operating out of a place of fear. And I think that the reason they're operating out of a place of fear is because there's so much fragmentation. And there's a race to the bottom. You cannot have a race to the bottom when you've got clients that are demanding more. That's, that's counterintuitive. Um, and I used to go on Reddit all the time with an alias. Um, and I would just, and this is when we were three employees, four employees, I would just hammer on everybody, raise your prices. Raise your prices, raise your prices, build a better solution, build a better product, build a better offering, but start with raising your prices. And they, they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. And so what's happening is, is you look at the stack of 10 years ago and you look at the stack today, the stack is far more expensive today than it was back then. You have solutions today in your stack that you didn't have back then, but the prices are the same. The prices haven't changed. Um, and you have to differentiate. And so when I look at all these different companies, I go, oh, my God, they're not focusing on branding. They're not focusing on talent acquisition. They're not focusing on differentiation. They're not raising their prices to the appropriate amount to deliver. They're over promising in the sales and under delivering in the experience. And they're ruining it for the other guy, which they may be the other guy, which is like when they go pitch and say, hey, this is what we do and whatever. They go, oh, we've heard that before. You know, and, and the saying that I always say in this company is I always go, when I lived in Boston, I remember that there was four places within walking distance of my house that had the best burrito in Boston. All of them said they had the best burrito in Boston. They all weren't good. The one that did have the best was the Lolita's and they didn't tell anyone they had the best one. So like, I, I feel like they're all trying to compete on this. We're better and the, the, the clients are tired of it. They're tired of hearing they're better. Um, and so the whole industry needs to, to raise its prices and it, and it needs to do that so it can actually deliver meaningful results. You know, and there's more and more pr pressure from security and all these different things. And if you don't raise your prices, there's no way you can deliver that. And now combine that with the labor shortage and the other challenges that are happening, you know, the salaries are going up, but they're not raising their prices to the client. Hey, we're guilty too. We haven't raised our prices in five years. You know, and we're feeling the pressure from that too, which means we're putting a bunch of pressure on unit economics, which is we got to figure out how to build more automations, how to lower our price, um, you know, to deliver our services. Um, but what we're not doing is going, oh, we can't afford top talent. We need to go find lesser talent. I am steadfast on finding the best people and, and doing whatever it takes to pay them the best. So from our perspective, what keeps me up at night is I believe that right now we've got yellow cab and green cab and white cab fighting and you don't know the difference between any of them either back then you know this one's nine 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 this one's eight 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 i don't know you know i feel like they're all fighting they're all consolidating they're all trying to figure out how do they deliver at the same price cheaper and they're doing it through acquisition private equity is throwing money at them um there's somebody called uber and there's another company called bird and they're going to come and when they show up in this marketplace they're going to create choice that right now is electric AI. Electric AI is, in my opinion, the bird scooter of the industry. Listen, I'll pay five bucks for the bird scooter. I know I'm going to have to push it a couple times. That's fine. It'll get me from A to B for super, super cheap. That's all I need for now. I'm a tourist on vacation, whatever it is. Who's Uber right now? Who's Uber? Who's, who's coming in and going to serve the other side of that market, which is, hey, I want the best. I want you know, a really talented firm. We're, we're doing something important. We, we, we see our business as doing meaningful things, so we want to hire a firm that's going to help us accomplish these goals. We don't see IT as a utility anymore. Um, I don't know who that is right now. I, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think it would be us and that I don't hope it's going to be us, um, but I just, I'm, where is that 800 pound gorilla right now you know and it's a big enough market that, that will be created 
I'm going to ask, do you worry about a Microsoft or Apple like like raising their enough of the bar where they can do the basics to push away all the 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 basic infrastructure pieces away and then then companies like yours build on top of that? Is that a scenario you see likely? I think it makes sense on paper. Um, where I see it falling apart is that Microsoft is never first to innovate. They're first to copy and then cons- and then basically you know lower the price to nothing to then acquire. So they're always following somebody else's innovation, whether that's Zoom, whether that's Slack, whoever it is, they're never first. And so there's to say that Microsoft will own the market is to say that they will own all the innovation. Um, and I just don't think that that's accurate. There's always going to be these emerging technologies, these emerging things that people want to take advantage of. And the problem will always be that they don't have the labor to help them capitalize on that. Um, even, you know, I don't think any turnkey solution is going to exist that you just sign up for a service and they magically deliver you uh, a nice enterprise turnkey solution. There's always going to be labor in the mix. That's where the logic exists. So I don't think that that would be the case. However, I do believe that MSPs are pushing their clients to that solution more than the clients are asking, by the way. And what I mean by that is MSPs see it as the easiest way to solve for the whole stack problem with the least amount of sprawl and complexity. And I actually see on Reddit and others more push from it from some of the people working in these MSPs saying, I want to move my client from this solution to this solution because it benefits them and they can they already have established relationships with Microsoft or whatever. And in my head, I'm going, did you even ask the client? Does the client want to move from Dropbox to that? Does the client want to move from Zoom to Teams? Or are you proposing that they can save money? And the the thing that always really like sticks in my head is, and this happened a long time ago in at our company, back when Zoom was early, uh, this would be like six years ago, I remember we had a consultant that kept giving the free Zoom to every client because it was cheap. And I found out about that the hard way, which is a client called me and said, hey, you yeah, know, we were small at the time, maybe 10 people five people. And they said, what the hell? I was in the middle of an incredibly important call and 40 minutes in just disappeared. And what happened? You know, how embarrassing it is to say, well, the consultant thought that they were going to save you two bucks a month by going with the, the free version instead of the paid version. And they didn't bother to consult that with you. They just made that choice for you. Never again. We never offered the free version again. Everyone is on paid, you know, um, because the last thing I want to do is be in a situation where I'm making financial decisions for the client. Instead, propose it to them. Say, would you like to be on Teams? Listen, the whole world knows Teams sucks. You know, um, it's not Slack. It's not Zoom. It's trying to get there. I get it. But no client or person of yours, oh, I love Teams. You know, so the idea that you would move clients to that or whatever, because Microsoft is offering this full top to bottom, more integrated suite, um, yeah, I just don't think that's what the clients want. Um, so no, I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Um, if I was a more traditional MSP, I would actually be excited about that because now let's just assume they accomplish that. I can just buy from one vendor, which already has established channels for this and you know whatnot, and that makes my stack simpler. But if you're aiming at that and you think that's the problem, you don't understand what's going on in this space. That is not the challenge of this space. So if you were starting an MSP today, like an MSP or an IT, if you were starting over, what would that look like? I don't think I would get into this space today. Um, and the reason I say that is what's going to be required from a cash outlay perspective, um, from a talent perspective to compete with some of these, whether it's electric AI, whether it's us, um, or whether it's the rollups, right? The 12 platforms that many of you probably know, three or four platforms. There's about 12 out there. Um, and there are companies like Evergreen that own 40 MSPs under different names. They compete in their own backyard with another MSP they own, right? The idea that you're going to be able to compete with them with what they're building and make a meaningful size lifestyle, I just don't see that. I mean, that's like, to me, that's the, the guy that owned, that's the limo business of 2008. You could buy a limo in 2008, 2007, have a couple Escalades or whatever it is, and people would call you directly and you provide this amazing service to get to them to the airport and you have this amazing clientele. I bet those people haven't acquired a new customer in a decade, right? And so I just think like if you're going to get into this space today, you need to think about it differently. You need to um, probably take more of a technology approach, which is it's not about the solutions you're delivering, but how it's delivered. Um, and I just think it, I, I wouldn't do it again today. I it took me 15 years to get to this point. And I, it was a brutal 15 years. Um, you know, really, really hard 15 years. I, I don't think I would get into the space again. You know, 
So let me let me do one sort of last question. I'm going to posit a theory that I've worked under, and you tell me if you think I'm right, right or wrong on this one. I've projected that I think this space may shake out and look a little bit like the CPA space in that you're going to have two elements. You're going to have a little bit of there are going to be some boundaries of regulation and certification, just like a CPA has. And additionally, it'll it'll tear into some large national companies you know, that are that are sizable organizations, and it will still have small practitioners all the way down that, that look like a local CPA would. What's your take on that? Well, the accounting industry doesn't change very frequently. While there is technology in that industry um, that helps deliver it a little bit better, if you've ever worked with the accounting department at any clients you support, they they take about 10 years to adopt new technology. I mean, we still had clients printing checks three years ago. Blew my mind. We haven't printed a check in a decade. Um, you know, they're still giving out amexes. So I, I guess I, I, I think I'm I think what you're saying is is there is a large potential for that. And I would argue that people like Accenture, Deloitte, and others are going, you know, they're probably thinking, oh, this is this is great. More regulation, more challenges for them. We'll come into this space and and we'll just grow our mega, you know, uh, professional services organizations. Accenture could have done this a long time ago. Accenture has podcasts about small business technology, et cetera. What why aren't they? You know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I always go, well, when is Accenture finally going to say, yeah, let's start an MSP or let's start doing this? I don't know. Um, I think, well, once again, I think it makes sense. I think your theory is correct. I just don't know why it hasn't happened, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know. And if the government is going to come in and regulate and everything, talk about a mess. You know, I mean, can you imagine, like, they barely understand technology. Um, how do you enforce it, right? I mean, you say CPAs are regulated. Don't tell me you don't have a buddy that's writing off his Corolla as a business expense and then driving it all weekend to, to, to go to restaurants, right? So enforcement versus rules, you know, like, they already are short on IRS. They're already short on all of that. I know they just hired a ton from what I hear. I guess there's some sort of interesting thing happening over there right now. But, um, you know, the rules in the actual doing of them are two separate challenges. And I don't see how they could regulate the massive amount. And then I don't, you want to know why they're so excited about it? They'd have, there'd have to be some interesting fees. They'd have to figure out how are we going to make money on this, the government, right? If we're going to regulate this and get involved in this, how do we make our money on it? Because it's obvious why the IRS exists. You're taking money from Uncle Sam. You know, who is MSP taking money from? Well, you could argue security of the, the, you know, obviously the U.S., right? Well, you know, these U.S. companies and, you know, it's in our best interest for them to be secure and everything. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I like that theory, but I don't know, man. OK, <laughs> well, so what, what's next for pliancy? Um, I mean, we got some interesting things in the works. Um, we're going to be investing more heavily into our engineering teams. Uh, we're going to be working with more and more enterprise vendors uh, about taking their solutions downstream and um, customizing them uh, where they can't reach. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that exists is some of the best technologies, uh, frankly, the MSP industry can't touch. It just has minimums. It has annual contracts. It's all designed for enterprise because if you're a startup and you're building some emerging technology, you need to go after enterprise to hit your growth numbers to get your next round, et cetera. You're not going to get that by having 3,000 salespeople going after five-person companies. However, the stickiness of a product is dictated early, not late, meaning that it costs you far more to get the enterprise company to switch from what's barely working to your amazing product, even if it is a better offering. And so I think the real opportunity for MSPs potentially, and maybe PAX 8 helps deliver this or whatever. I know some people over there. Um, you have to be able to figure out how do we get this emerging, amazing technology into the area where they can't get on their own and then become the conduit of that, which means, OK, so maybe now MSPs through Pax8 or somebody else has the ability to go bring Okta downstream. And Okta is willing to allow you to do that because they don't want to deploy their sales and costs and, you know, all of that sort of thing. It just doesn't make economical sense for them, but it makes economical sense for you, the MSP. Um, that could be something. However, I think one of the challenges we're seeing is that enterprise companies don't want you taking their technology downstream and then botching up their brand, meaning like you don't have the talent or the ability to deploy Okta efficiently or accurately. You're going to tarnish our names to these future enterprises. Um, and so they become very protective of that. And then you find seven years, 10 years later, they're like, you know, we should get into the MSP space. It's like, really, Duo and Okta? You know, Okta, Okta is still trying to get into the MSP space. You know, 20 years later, you know, ServiceNow is like, no, we should get into the MSP space. It's like, 
yeah, because now that they've exhausted all their enterprise opportunities, they're willing to now talk to MSPs. Um, but I think if that changes over time and the MSPs can shed some of the challenges that they have from a perception problem, frankly, I, I, you know, people don't look at MSPs as, you know, these, these, you know, Silicon Valley tech geniuses, you know, they look at us, frankly, as these little mom and pop businesses fixing laptops. Um, it's something I always felt was frustrating. It's like, no, not all of us are like that. Yes, those exist. The ones on El Camino Real with the flashing fixed laptop signs. Yes, those exist. That's not what we're doing. Um, and there's other MSPs out there that aren't doing that either. If we can get the ears of these enterprise companies to say, hey, we'll work with you to help deliver these emerging technologies earlier in these companies' life cycles, there's a big, huge emerging opportunity there. Um, but that's going to sound and look a lot more like consulting, not remote help desk. So now I'm going to give you one other theory and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to, to react to it. So I've, I've posited that there's a lot of money in, in the software companies of the tool providers that are serving MSPs. And they are actually motivated to keep this industry in that 10 year old approach that they're motivated because they want to sell more licenses to RMMs or PSAs or backups. What's your take on that? I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think I think they're so when you see private equity enter an industry, um, private equity structures its deals and how it makes its money very different than, say, growth equity or, or venture. The, the, the benefit to private equity is that it's established. You're growing slower intentionally because you're collecting EBITDA. Right. Um, there is no incentive to change how things are done right now. Um, and there is a ton of money coming in private equity wise. And there's these tools that are rolled up, whether it's Datto and Kaseya, et cetera. Um, if the industry changes, that, that is intimate doom for them. That is not good. Um, and they are highly incentivized with the billions of dollars that exist in that space to protect that. Now, I don't think they're going out and saying, don't, don't innovate, let's gobble up and let's prevent innovation. They're just not incentivized to do it themselves. It doesn't make sense. When, when you get to a certain size as a company that's backed by private equity or whatever, Innovation is risky and costly, and that is not how private equity structures their deals. And so now when you start seeing the MSP space getting consolidated through, through uh, private equity, that's, that's a problem, you know, and, and that's not good for the industry. So the problem I see is that there's not enough money venture going into the tools for MSPs, aka the picks and axes. And when you do see a pick, picks and axe investment, it's usually, I'm just going to be honest, it's usually pretty small. You know, $5 million uh, for somebody who wants to fix the billing and license consolidation problem. It's not going to move the needle. And I would argue that it's, it's almost a trap. With $5 million, you can build an MVP and then you get acquired by Kaseya because you're stuck. You didn't do anything meaningful enough to get that next investment, you know, at the size that you needed. But you were just, just successful enough that Kaseya will gobble you up. Um, and I think that that's become cyclical. So unless you start seeing people put meaningful money into these tools, um, you're, you're not going to – I don't think there's going to be any like holy moly moment where it's like, oh, look at this amazing company that raised $100 million. They're building a better PSA. You're just not going to see that. Um, and I don't think venture wants to go anywhere near this market despite the size and the opportunity. Then again, it looks like we're selling dispatch radios to Yellow Cab. So I don't blame them, right? Somebody needs to come out and, and just say we're going to do it completely differently. And the, the, the opportunities, when you look at the industry, and you look at the world, there are very few $150 billion opportunities. And that's what the size of this market is. It couldn't be any, any smarter for VC to be putting a lot of money into this. But they're just not. And I, I would argue that electric AI, thinking that going cheaper is the problem, and them being the only play with venture, it was not the right play. I don't believe making what we do cheaper is the problem. People are not saying, you know, I want to pay less for IT. They say, I want more IT. I want better IT. I want more security. Um, and so I think that that was, you know, that might serve a certain clientele, but that's not the real problem. The real problem we have is you don't have enough talent in this industry. There's no new talent coming into this industry. Um, and if we want to attract new talent to this industry, we need to do it in a way that they're excited about. And that's not how the industry is operating today. So, yes, I agree. So do you, do you think it's kind of a space ripe for disruption then because it seems like it's got those criteria you do oh it's frothy it is it is ripe for disruption the problem is is it still smells like labor and it's not SaaS. it's not 70 percent margins 
um, in the way that it could. But it will be that eventually. You might argue, yeah, Uber is SaaS. Well, I don't know. There's like 20 million drivers driving cars around, right? So displace the labor into a gig economy or a gig approach or franchise it or whatever it is. Just get the labor off our balance you know, book, uh, balance sheet. I, I don't think that that's, or profit and loss, loss statement, I should say, but I don't think that that's, you know, I, I think if somebody was willing to take that risk, if somebody's like, listen, I know that over time, computers have broke less, broken less. You know this, I know this. You, nowadays, you buy a laptop or whatever, you might go the entire length of your owning that laptop if you weren't technical, never having to have an issue with it. Now, we're technical, so we rebuild it like once every two years because we're like, oh, it seems slow or whatever. I know how to rebuild it. I'll rebuild it. But the reality is it's not breaking like it used to. It's not like, oh, it won't turn on. I mean, the, the, we have the data. We have a data team here, six people or whatever. It's like it's just not happening. And so that's only going to continue to get better. And pretty soon they'll go buy laptops without talking to IT and they'll just log into it and it'll just work. So the labor, it's not about the labor's unsexy or it makes this market uh, uh vc does want to get in there that will solve itself over time the labor will go away because the technology will get better and what will be left is who connects the dots um who who negotiates how they get access to these technologies and get them deployed all of that is very easy to automate one might argue it's in heart it's really hard to start a company well legal zoom made it achievable for 99 bucks in two hours right so that might be in the future what this turns out to be and then others might use whatever platform that might be so that they can be the labor portion, right? So they're using this technology and then they're the labor portion. And that might be the next wave of MSPs. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's ripe for disruption. I think it's going to take time. It's not going to be five years from now. It might be 10. Well, VC likes five-year returns, seven-year returns. So three years from now, there's going to be some big changes in this industry, I think, because it's going to start aligning with, with uh, A, we'll get out of the recession correction, whatever it is. Um, and then B, uh, it's going to align with the exits that they'd be looking for. So there's going to be some bold plays, I think, over the next maybe three years. Well, you've given us an awful lot to think about. Marcus, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And thanks for, for having me. Thanks for your time and attention. Time is a finite resource, and I really value you giving me some of yours. If you like this video, you can let me know with a like of the video, and even more valuable, hitting the subscription button. My content is all free, and I use metrics like subscriptions to pay the bills, so it has real value. The content here is produced under ethics guidelines, posted at businessof.tech. If you're interested in more content like this, you can get access to content early via our Patreon at patreon.com slash MSP radio. It's our give what you want model where you set the value of what you think the content is worth. If you like this podcast, you can catch it daily as the five minute news and commentary show, The Business of Tech, available on all your favorite podcatchers with links at businessof.tech. Just hit that big blue button to subscribe. Again, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen, and I really value the interaction. If you want to say something in the comments, I do respond and watch all that, and I look forward to talking to you next time.